I'm mic'd. Mic's on. So let me know if she. So I'll have her with me all the time, so whenever she does get here. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to the day that the Lord has made. Oh my gosh, I thought I was in church. Let's try that again. Welcome to the day that the Lord has made. Amen, amen. It is such a glorious day. I've been up since 3 o'clock this morning. I've had a couple cups of coffee. I've had a bang soda. Um, I've listened to some DMX. I've listened to some Easy E. I listened to some Nelly. That was my pregame. Um, so let's, uh, we're going to say a prayer later on, but um, to lift up um, DMX and his family and our thoughts. Um, died way too soon. And, um, but let's, uh, let's start off. Any prayers of joy or concern? And there is a prayer of joy that um, Peach finally showed up to church <laughs> on Peach time as usual. Any prayers of joy or concern? Monzel, it is so, I am so grateful you are here, man. Amen. I'm glad they're all. Mom tried calling you. I don't know if she actually reached you. Okay, okay. Miss Billy. Amen, amen. And we will be doing something with the, thank you, we will be doing something when it comes to feeding the kids and providing lunches. If we can't have them actually come into and eat, we will find something. We will find some way of making sure they're taken care of. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. We need to make bags. Oh, yeah, we will be. We will be. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Any other prayers of joy or concern? Karen. I just want to thank Calvary for hosting the service. Amen. Amen. And I want to thank the SPRC, SPPRC, for working with me to figure out what is uh, the most fair and equitable way of doing this. Um, one of my passions is, is family. And um, it is my passion that um, while we are two churches and we do have two different ways of doing things, um, I love the fact that we have somewhere in the neighborhood of now that Bath and Kez has finally shown up, the mouth that roared. Um, it is, and I'm so grateful to have, you know, we've got somewhere close to 40 to 45 people here today. Um, so it is um, fantastic to see more people in these pews. 
And um, starting this week, um, Ms. Billy, can we rip this daggone tape off of the pews? I would like to see it gone, and I know we can still sit where we're socially distancing, but I do not like the reminder anymore um, of where we're being forced to socially distance. I think that as long as we remember, and um, my, my COVID team here um, will remind people to, to not sit so close if they're not in the same household, then I think that's, that's just another step forward where we can start to get back to a little bit of normalcy. Um, so let's pray for the churches. And Karen, as you said, it is wonderful to see everybody in here. Um, it's a good mixture of, um, of both churches. Um, any, other, any other prayers that you're concerned? Yes, sir. Amen, amen. That is a very good thing. That is a very good thing. Any others? Going once. Going twice. So one of the things that we mentioned one word here that is very, the common theme is, is a word, word of thanks. So instead of having the ushers um, to pass a plate around because, number one, we, we don't like that because people, you know, it's COVID. But I do want to, while we're taking the plates back to the back of the sanctuary where they'll be for you to put in your tithe and your offering, is let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes, and let's just say a prayer of thanks real quickly. So if you could, bow your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, number one, thank you so much for the day that you have made and allowing us to be able to rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you so much for, for the blessings that you've given upon us. Thank you so much for the blessings of, of both of these churches, for the blessings of being able to come together and worship as one family under God working for you. Thank you so much for everything that you have given us and allowing us to be stewards and managing those gifts that you've given to us. And please accept our token offerings as a sign of our appreciation to use for your will and to shine your light and to shine your love on others. Amen. You know, and one of the things that I love about church these days in this age that we find ourselves in is it's not just those in the sanctuary. We've discovered something rare and something cool and something really brings a lot of joy to me, and that is the fact that the church doesn't have to happen just in a building. So we have people here in the sanctuary. We have people in each of their homes that are watching online. Um, I have family in Tennessee that are watching. There's people from both churches that watch the live streaming. Um, so let's say welcome to our e-family, our electronic family. So on the count of three, say good morning and welcome. One, two, three. Good morning, I'm surprised Brittany's actually up at this hour, but... If you could, please rise and join me in the call to worship. For those of you that are unfamiliar with how we do things, I will raise my hand. Hey, Paige, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, thank you. So when I raise my hand, that is when you all will follow along after me. And when I put my hand down, then that is where just I talk. And Peach is my, um, my, my go-to when it comes to whether or not I know people can hear me because her hearing is so bad, and I don't know if she has a hearing aid on or not. So if she can hear me, I know everybody else can. So if you could, please join along with me. Please rise if you're at home. The Lord has called you here this day. Lord... Reveal to us your purposes for us. Open your hearts to receive God's good news. Lord, make us ready to serve you. Come, let us worship God. Let us sing our praises to the Almighty One. Amen. Please be seated.
Thank you, Jim. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you could, if, if every head, head could bow and every eye could be closed. Heavenly Father, the darkness of winter has been our companion. Now the days are getting longer. Bring your light to us that we might see your glory and may work for you, offering hope and peace and freedom to this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And the people said? Amen. Amen. Before I call the kids forward, because I have to have a few seconds where I just psych myself up, because this is what I call the scariest part of every service, is the children's moment, because you never know what's going to come out of either my mouth or theirs. So if you could, let's bow our heads and, and close our eyes one more time. Patient Lord, you know how accustomed we are to, to magic tricks. Our spirits and our senses get fooled easily. We would be just like the disciples at first not believing what we were seeing and then wanting to take a monument to the event. Thank you for being so patient with us. Forgive us when we get so wrapped up in the moment or get so wrapped up on ourselves that we don't take time enough to understand the significance of what the moment is that we find ourselves in. Help us to pause, to reflect, to thank, and to thank you for the blessings of unexpected revelations. Give us wisdom and strength to be your, your disciples, proclaiming your transforming love to all people. Amen. And the people said, <sighs> Kezia, if all the kids could please come forward. All the kids, come on. You too, Monzel. Right here, right here in front, right here in front. All the kids down here to where Monzel is. Beth, I need your help too. Nancy, I'm going to need your help in a second, maybe. So, Kezia, you got to stand up. Stand up for me. You got to. Thank you so much. You are so awesome. Kezia is my TikTok guru. There you go. And she is my ego booster. Buster. Because I cannot possibly have an ego with this, this kid around. So there was, uh, what was it, two weeks ago, Beth, where she asked, what is the first, you can sit down now, you can sit down, ladies. What is the first musical instrument? And she comes to me and she goes, what's the first musical instrument? And I go, I'm thinking, she means it's a joke. And so I'm going, I don't know. What is the first musical instrument? I'm waiting for the punchline. And then so we ask Jim. And Jim goes, probably your voice. <laughs> and so then Kezia goes, that's, yeah, that's, that's what somebody told her. And she looks at me and she goes, Pastor, you don't know a daggone thing, do you? <laughs> <sighs> I love kids because, number one, they're honest because they don't know how not to be honest. And number two, they're adorable as can be, and they have a great sense of humor. Um, so, Kezia, you're in, what, gymnastics or what? Will you do all the tumbling? Gymnastics. gymnastics. Are you two ladies in, like, sports or, like, cheerleading or gymnastics or singing? Piano. 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 Piano was my difficulty because I went, but it was during football season when I was their age, and I decided it was easier for me to play football than it was for me to learn the piano. So the only song I know how to play it happens to be a, um, has to be a clue from an episode of Scooby-Doo. That is the only song I know. No, A-C-D-D-E-C-A-D-E. -D -E. 
So I'm going to ask you, Munzel, what is the hardest thing you had to learn how to do besides be patient and, and like, not say what's on your mind? Younger, 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 younger. Uh, how to tone it down, how to, how to just try to fit in with everybody else. You've done such a great job with that, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, he hasn't. <laughs> so one of the things that, that Christ asks us, asks us to do that is very, very difficult, and that is put others before us. So that when, when we do something, we're doing it for others. We're not doing it for ourselves. Like the one time, I think it was last week or week before last, we talked about how hard it is to forgive. It's very hard to live in love. And it sounds like it's an easy thing. But when you were playing the piano, was it very hard to learn how to play the piano at first? Very hard. Gymnastics, was it very hard the first time you had to do it? I mean, could you do a cartwheel here? No. Beth, can she do a cartwheel? Yeah. 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 When she first started, how hard was it? She was two. She was two. <laughs> so, Kaz, you want to do a cartwheel together? Yeah. Good, because I can't do one. <laughs> yeah, see, now that was not going to happen. <laughs> I'm 52 years old. I do not do cartwheels. So let's, let's take a moment. Let's think about how hard it is for us to learn gymnastics, for us to learn how to play the piano for us to learn how to fit in and, and tone it down. So what was the hardest thing you had to do as a kid? <sighs> okay, so these three are the ones that were successful. <laughs> these two have not been that good at what they, what they thought they were going to do. <laughs> High five. There you go. So let's think about how hard it is to do, some, to do some things that Christ and God is asking us to do, like always think of others, always love, and always forgive, because we've always been loved, even when we're not the most lovable. Let's be honest. Are there some times when your, your, Beth's not here, your mom's not here? Or are there some times when you know, they might have to get after you? It's kind of hard for you not to be here if you talk. So let's think about how they extend the grace to us. So it's our job to also extend the grace back to others and the love back to others. So let's bow our heads and say a prayer real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the, the gift of the cross. Thank you so much for leading by example, for being our coach to teach us these lessons that are very hard to learn on our own, but it's through you through your coaching and through your, your lessons, that we are able to love others as you want us to love others, that we are able to do for others and think of others as you, are able, as you ask us to do for others. Please help us to continue to grow and to learn these lessons. In your name we pray. Amen. Little kids, big kids, you are dismissed. Monzel, you can't go. You can't go a place, man. You need some help getting up. <laughs> I know, that's the scary part. So I started doing, practicing with having little video children's messages over the last few months, just tinkering around, seeing how well they would be received. And I sent them to some of the, some of the families that have the young kids, and one of the families, they showed them, and the kids loved them. And then one of the kids said, wait a minute, pastor's got a YouTube page? And the mom said, yeah. He goes, can I subscribe to it? And she goes, yeah, because I want to give him a thumbs down. <laughs> uh, he gave me a thumbs up, but I love kids because they keep us young, and they keep our minds focused on what is really important in life. So as we could, let's remember the churches, and we talked, you know, Miss Billy did a great job telling us about what our goals are with feeding the kids this summer, and there's also about clothing people.
giving, helping people out that are needy, helping people out that are the, you know, they're the ones that are ostracized, they're the ones that are marginalized, and it is one of our joys and one of our blessings to be able to help those that are in need of help. And that takes your support, whether it's by time or by money or by imparting wisdom. You know, the, the gifts that you give the church um, are very, very much appreciated, and it allows us to continue to do the work that, that we need to do. So if you could, please bow your heads and close your eyes for me. Heavenly Father, we continue to hold on to the celebration and triumph of Easter. As we look back over the last year, we realize that many of us can identify with Thomas's doubt. Can we be the church, the body of Christ, when we can't see the body gathered in our sanctuary together? Yet Christ has opened our eyes to his risen body that can't be confined by walls and is not diminished by precautions and social distance. And as we make our gifts available to him, we affirm the resurrection power that we have seen. And so we say again, hallelujah, in the powerful name of Jesus. We pray as he taught his disciples to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we do have our offering plates. As I mentioned earlier at the start of service, we do have our offering plates in the very back of the sanctuary. Um, so please, if you could, we appreciate all of your gifts. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jim. I always love hearing Jim play. A little bit different than my music choice of this morning with my pre-gaming, but I, I, I still love the music. So amen and thank you, Jim. Before I, I get on with, the, uh, with the, the liturgy for the day, with the scripture reading today, I would like for you to bow your heads and close your eyes one more time. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us all here together today to hear your words, to hear your will. Allow us to, or help us to, open our ears and open our minds and open our hearts and open our lives and receive your message. In your name we pray, amen. So today's message, today's, um, we're going to kick off a new sermon series. I have no idea at this point how long it's going to be, and I have no idea... Um, I have no idea what it's going to be even next week. You know, it's still coming to me. But um, the, the, the title of today's service is Sneaky Jesus. And when I was going through the 12-week the or the 12-part um, series that ended on Easter Sunday, one of the, um, I can't remember which one of the Sundays because, to be quite honest, Easter week just was a blur to me. Eight services and four sermons, two Easter egg hunts in one week. Uh, my brain was dead by the time Sunday afternoon came. But um, I mentioned sneaky Jesus because Jesus snuck up on Cleopas on the road to Emmaus and snuck up on Cleopas and, and, her, and his companion and was going, you know, what you talking about? And like, like Jesus does not know what you're talking about. Like the answer is not going to know. You know. He didn't have to ask. But it struck me as that, that, is, a, that is a good sermon series. And it fits with um, what the main topic is. So today's topic is batter up, brought to you by Nelly. Um, but batter up, sneaky Jesus, because sometimes Jesus is not the most, he's not the most, here's a, here's a flaming bush, or he's not the big billboard in the sky. Sometimes he sneaks up on you, and he works with you, and he works through you to do something, and you don't realize it until you actually through it, and you look back, 
And then you realize that God was working in your life, on your life, and through your life. Sometimes he can be sneaky like that. So if you could, please join me in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 18. I picked a, um, I picked the people that um, have won. So Manzel, what I did is I was bribing the congregations with a gift card to either um, Dietrich or, or Bella Napoli or however you pronounce that place. And then um, everybody that brought a Bible with them last Sunday, um, if, they, if they showed their Bible, then they were entered into a, a general chance to be able to be the person that receives that gift card. So I've got them, and then I promptly left them at home um, because, well, I had had too much coffee, and I had been up since 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was lucky I brought my shoes. Um, so, so next Sunday at both places, I'll be giving those out. And then there's the, the one young recipient who the first week I did it, um, whenever, I've got hers in my pocket for whenever she does come back. But if you could, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 18. Whether you're in the Bible or your Bible app, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 18. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the, in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we share this treasure in, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are, are always delivered unto the death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that, which, that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things we are, are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but through our outward man perish. Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light, our, for our light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Let's go through that one more time. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so is today's word. Amen. So Jesus is being a little sneaky, and I was talking with my friend Monzel. First of all, I've got to tell a Monzel story, Monzel. And this Monzel, I've, I've known him. He's not just a friend. He's like a brother to me. And I've known his family. from. They're from um, my home church is where I met Monzel at Lavelle United Methodist Church. And there's this one time when I was an usher at Lavelle, 
and I was back with the ushers back at, you know, before the sanctuary, and the choir was, was singing up front, and they were sounding beautiful, and, and Pastor Frankie, Reverend Ravel, was, was in the back with us, and Monzel's there getting ready to go up to the balcony, and the choir is singing this beautiful song about how Jesus loves you, and Pastor Frankie looks over at Monzel and goes, everybody but you. We, we, used to, I mean, we were a bunch of, like, brothers, and we would pick at each other like brothers pick at each other. And I remember one of the other ushers would go up to the other usher and go, look at your beautiful wife up there singing in the choir. You know, if you were up there singing in the choir with her, there still wouldn't be a man up there singing with your wife. It was a very brutal group. But the love was present in every little joke, in every little criticism. When, um, when I was going through my divorce, it was the church that picked me up and made sure I stayed on the path. When people were having problems, we were helping each other out. We were interested, invested in each other's lives. And so that carried over into our personal lives outside of church. And I remember there was one time, and Monzel and I have helped out at Holy Grounds repeatedly, including volunteering during one Christmas season. Um, where we made a complete mess of that place, but we learned how to make sandwiches, we learned how to use the espresso machine, and we drank as much espresso and coffee as we possibly could. And I remember there's one day that Betsy, and, and Betsy is, um, is the sister-in-law of the owner, and Monzel and I were in there talking, and um, Betsy hollers over, and she goes, Monzel, I've got your, I've got your muffin. And she's yelling at us from across the, the, the business. And she goes, I've got your muffin. Do you need a fork? Or are you going to eat it like a man? <laughs> and I, that was the funniest thing I've ever heard because, it, again, Betsy is one of the most sweetest, most gentlest, most loving women you will ever meet. And um, I think I proposed to her 80-year-old mother once when I tasted one of her Rice Krispie cookies because if you meet somebody that bakes that well, you don't let them out of your life. And, and so they laugh at me. But it's a case where I asked Monzel because part of this sermon series about sneaky Jesus is about how Jesus sneaks up and in the most unconventional way sometimes begins to do a work in you. And sometimes it's when you're, you're young like, like Kezia. And sometimes it's when you're, you're older. And I'm not going to mention anybody's older. I'll just say Monzel because Monzel and I are the same age. And even older than us. Sometimes the work is a quick fix, and it's all of a sudden, it's just boom, and all of a sudden you've changed, and you're being the light to everybody else. And sometimes, sometimes it's that seven-mile walk to Emmaus. Sometimes it's not even on the seven-mile walk. Sometimes it's on the return trip where you realize what God is doing through you and in you. And we talk about how I want to be happy. We talk about I want to be happy. I want peace. I want freedom. And here's where it comes from. When God works through you and you open your hearts and your lives to his will and his word and his ways, all of a sudden you realize that's where your joy comes from. And sometimes it's a very unconventional place. And some of y'all are going, How? You know, I can't believe they were saying that about each other when they were in Lavelle or at the, at the coffee shop. Those are some of the happiest moments of my life. And I remember the first sermon I delivered, uh, my mom was, was sick as a dog with the flu, and she sat in the back of the sanctuary at Lavelle. And, and I, I'm nervous because this is my home church. And I start to preach, and it was on Acts 3-2. And I'll never forget it because I look over to the side, and who here knows Pastor Bernadette Ross? Raise your hand. She is, she is another mom to me, and she is one of the rare people that I will listen when she gives me a lecture. I'm um, sometimes not even my real mom, but I, I, will, I will humor my real mom. But so I look over to the side, and there's my former pastor, my, one of my faith mentors, Pastor Ross. And if you all know her, you know she is a very, she, she knows. And I go, I can't look over there. I'm going to get too nervous. So I look over here to the side, and I see Pastor Ravel, who is my current pastor at the time. And he's got some guest pastors with him. And I go, I can't do that. Let me look beyond Pastor Ravel. And then I see, um, I see Cindy. And I see Cindy Morrill. Does anybody know Cindy Morrill? Cindy Morrill, has, has, she used to teach Sunday school at, at Lavelle for 40-some years. 
and she was even a teacher of home ec, and Wade, her husband, was, was a teacher of, of um, shop classes and for the longest time, and she was, she's the most sweetest woman you'll ever met, you'll ever meet, and you know, she was right behind Frankie. I go, no, let me look over here again. And then right behind Bernadette, there's a gentleman by the name of Tim Donaldson, who has been very heavily involved with the, with the conference for some 1,500 years you know, long. And I can't, and I realize, I'm in my family. I'm with my family. Let's do it. Let's have fun with it. And I'm going to grow from it. And I did. But it was a case where I realized it's, it's ridiculous to be nervous about that. Because when you are with family, you can be authentic. You can be vulnerable. You can pick at each other. You can tease each other. And still know, like, I pick at Peach left and right. Deservedly so. Monzel, I pick at left and right. But I love him like a brother. I love Peach like another mom. And... It's one of the most amazing things. You get that joy, and it's not from somebody else because if you're looking for joy and peace and, and happiness from somebody or something or some place, that's temporary. It's not going to last. But when you put it in the Lord and when that Holy Spirit comes into your life, that's where that joy, that happiness comes from. And so with that being said, before I, I start talking more because I can talk about this forever, I did ask Monzel to come talk with us, and um, he asked me what about, and, and I said, I have no idea, just rant and rave, man. Just, just go off on a tangent, and, and we'll see if the place stands up afterward. So I want you all to please welcome Monzel, and give him your attention. Appreciate it. Love you, man. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You get to wear this. Oh, please. Oh, it's for those people. I got a big mouth. It's, it's, for, who doesn't it's know. for those people. So I'm going to put the microphone oh, okay. for them. right there. Okay, that's good. Perfect. You don't get my coffee, though. I don't drink coffee. It's all good. I used to love you. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, crazy without it, so. Yeah. All right, well, look, you know, I'm here to talk about you, all right? I am all about the kids, all about the kids. And quite frankly, I don't care what people think about me and how I get my results. It's the kids that matter. I've been doing this for almost 27 years. That's three quarters of my adult life that I've been working with kids. I came in here today, and I sat on the parking lot, and I'm like, like Pastor Brent, I'm listening to my music, getting prepared to hang out with the kids. And people keep getting out of their cars, and I don't see any kids. And I don't see any kids. I don't see any youth. And I'm thinking to myself, what's going on here? If you don't have kids, you don't have a future. You got to get the kids in here. You got to get those families, 35 and under, in here. Ten years when you guys are not teaching classes and not, you know, doing the things that you're doing now. Who's taking over? I don't see anybody sitting here right now taking over in 10 years. you got to get the younger families in here with the kids. That's where the church is going to grow. All right? Give me a minute here. i got a couple of things I need to grab. All right. I'll start out. I apologize for that, but like I said, I'm passionate about the kids, and I, that, that's why I'm here. All right. So a little introduction about myself. All right. I'm a father. Um, I've been helping with youth uh, for 27 years. Like I said, I've been a coach, a referee, a youth leader, a youth pastor, a Sunday school teacher, a mentor. Um, I've worked with youth in local theater for probably close to 20 years. Um, you know, I'm here to show the kids the way, all right? And everybody has a different way of doing that. I can't do it like you do it. I can't do it like you do it, or you, or you. I have to do it the way I know how. Second Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. And he said unto me, 
My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When I am weak, I am strong. I'm nobody. I'm Monzel. But the kids respond to me because I'm real with them. I don't pull punches. I don't play games. I don't try to pull the wool over their eyes. Kids grow up differently than we did. Okay? They have access to things we didn't have access to until we were in our eight, in our late teens or early 20s. Any kid that has a cell phone or access to a computer, they got porn in their pocket 24-7. They can go watch, you know, I've had kids talk to me about the dark web. I didn't even know how to get to the dark web. And I got kids 13 and 14 saying, have you ever seen this? Have you seen that? I ain't seen that. I didn't even know it existed. I should have. I should have because I work with the kids. Talk to them. Listen to them. All right? Good and the bad. You got to have it both ways. You can't have it just one way. You can't have it that you got to come in here, sit down, be quiet until church is over. Kids don't respond to that. They're not raised that way today. They were not raised the way you were raised. What worked for you is not going to work for them. You got to be real with the kids, I'm telling you. They can spot a fake a mile away. And if you start preaching to them, they're done. You got kids that I like to look at it as a circle. Okay, in the inner circle, you got your core. Most churches, that's about 10 to 15 kids. Okay, I'm just going from the biggest to the smallest and packing it in there. So 10 to 15 kids, that's your core group. It's going to be there no matter what. Then on the next circle, the next round, you've got maybe 20 more kids. They're the ones that are going to come for your events, or they're the ones that are going to come with their friends just to hang out. They didn't come to hear anything about this. They came because they want to hang with their friend. It's my job to get them into this. Then you have the next group, that third circle. That's the outsider who comes because he was forced to come or she was forced to come. Mom or maybe grandmother, whoever's taking care of them said, you're going to go do this. So they come, but they sit over there in a corner don't really talk to anybody, have their earbuds in, they're sitting there with their hoodie up, punched down, not interacting at all. That's the kid I want. That's the kid I'm going to talk to. That's the kid I'm going to get to know. Again, I come in here today and I don't see any kids. I know COVID is a thing right now. And a lot of people don't come to church, but I would almost bet that if there were five teenagers in here on a regular Sunday, that might be pushing. Church is going to die if you don't get the kids in, guys. That's bottom line. Center Street's a perfect example. They did wonderful things for a long time. They got stuck in their ways. They wouldn't bend to today, to what the kid today needs. It's got to be this way. It's got to be that way. You can't do it any other way. And now that church is gone. Can't be like that. When a kid comes in here or a kid passes you on the street and they got their pants down around their ankles, that drives me insane. But I'm still going to say something to the kid. Hey, man, I'm walking past him. How you doing? I'm still going to say something to the kid. Who cares if he ignores me? Who cares if he responds to me? 90% of the time, that kid heard you. And if I do that, every time I see that kid, whether he responds or not, eventually, that kid's going to be looking for me. Oh, he went by and didn't say anything. I wonder why. You know, we've never really talked, but he knew that I said hi to him all the time. You got to get started somehow. 
Their world's different than ours. You got to understand that. What worked for you is not going to work for them. And I've said that many times already, and I'll probably say it a thousand times more. All right? Talk to them about life, okay? Talk to them about the things that they see in school and what they're watching on TV, okay? Don't hide them from things. Yes, we want to protect them. We want to keep them from making mistakes that are going to hurt them. But sometimes you have to let them make those mistakes. As a parent, sometimes you have to say, is the consequence for this bad enough that I really need to step in? Or do I let them learn the lesson? Because if you step in every single time, they never learn the lesson. You got to let them fail sometimes. Nobody wants to talk to kids about drugs. Nobody wants to talk to them about sex, alcohol. Nobody wants to talk to them about suicide. How many suicides have we had in the schools here in the last five years? One, too many. If it was only one, that's too many. And we've had several, several kids that I knew that I wish were in my youth group when I was still doing that at LaVeo. Right now, I don't, I don't have a youth group anymore. Um, I, I, I was, my, my year, two years was up, and I stepped down from that position, let somebody else take over. Do I still talk to kids? Absolutely. I came in here today. I grabbed Cameron. I went back in the back and talked to him. I was like, man, I've seen you before. I said, do you go over to Holy Cross? Do you go over to Pastor Brent's other church and for the after-school program? Oh, yeah, I go there sometimes. That's where I've seen you. We shot basketball, didn't we? Oh, yeah, that was you out there, yeah. He remembered silly little things like that. I'm 52. I can't play basketball with him, but I can go out and shoot horse and clown around with him. Who do you think is going to get through to a kid quicker? The guy who is taking time to invest in them and hang out with them and talk to them and be real, or the guy who's preaching to them, telling them what they're doing wrong, telling them how they have to do things. Which guy is making a difference? It sure ain't the preacher. Because as soon as you start preaching to a kid, they're done. They've tuned you out. They don't hear another word. I have four sons. That range from age 22 to 29. I'm sorry, 27. 27. I do have six sons. I had two from primary, so, um, but I didn't get to raise the oldest two. But the four sons that my wife Julie and I had, they're not perfect, but they're good people. I'll take a good person any day. Okay? My youngest son, way more intelligent than I am, studying microeconomics and business and working on his master's degree from home now. You know, he talks to me sometimes, and I'm like, I don't even understand what he's saying. I mean, that's just the truth. But I listen to him because it's important to him. If a kid wants to tell you something, listen to him. Just listen. You don't have to agree with them. Listen to them. Hear what they have to say. Find out what's going on in their mind. No matter how much control you think you have over your kids, it's not enough. It's not. You can't control when they go out to school and there's another kid with a phone showing them something that you don't allow them to see at home. You're not there when that other kid is hitting a blunt and passing it to him or her. You prepare them for it if you talk to them about it. If you don't talk to them about it, it's 50-50. If you talk to them about it, your odds are greater that they're going to do the right thing. You didn't talk to them at all, 
Might as well forget it. And again, don't preach to them. Just talk to them. I told my sons, if you're out, I am not stupid. Your mother grew up this way. I grew up this way. Okay? I know that you're going to try things. I know that you're going to experiment with things. If you're out and you think that you need my help, or you think maybe I shouldn't drive the car, call me. No questions asked. I'll come and get you. And they've all taken me up on that. Now, did I growl at them that night? Did I fuss at them that night? No. I couldn't remember that. I went and I picked them up. I told them everything would be okay, and I took them home. Now, the next day is a different story. <laughs> okay. The next day, they got, this is not going to happen again. <laughs> but that night, they didn't need that that night. That night, they needed me to be there for them. And I was. You got to let them be who they are. Guide them as best you can. But if you try and make them something they're not, one, they're going to be miserable. You're going to be miserable. They're going to decide for themselves. As they're growing up, we teach them the values that they need to have. But ultimately, they have to make those decisions for themselves. 13-year-old, do I let them learn a lesson? Or is this something that's a little more serious and I need to protect them? All right? That's going to be different for each person in here. But you still have to make that choice. You still have to let them make mistakes sometimes. The kids that come are all at a different spiritual level. There are some kids that were in my last youth group that were more knowledgeable about the Bible than I am. You know, I don't have a problem with that. I had another helper that was better equipped to teach with them on their level. That core kid that, that Janelle was teaching, that's her specialty. My specialty is the kid that's over there. You got to be real with them. You got to be real with them. I had a young man in my youth group that went with me to an event called The Rock down in Ocean City every February. Took him for like seven years. Always kind of in trouble, doing some things he shouldn't have been doing. The last year, the last year he went with me, his senior year. That's the last time he was able to go to this event with me. A small thing happened in the convention center. You got to think, there's five to 7,000 kids at this event every year. I've been going for 18 years. Okay? Five to 7,000 kids all experiencing the same thing at different spiritual levels. This boy lost his mind because somebody took the seat that him and his girlfriend sat in the day before. Now, granted, there was probably 20 empty seats right around that seat. That wasn't the point for him. That was his seat. That's his mentality. That was my seat. I ended up taking him out. We went about a block down the street to McDonald's got some food, sat there and talked for three hours. Sitting in that van, he finally understood all the stuff I've been trying to tell him for the last seven years, all the stuff his mom and dad have been trying to tell him, his grandparents have been trying to tell him, his teachers in school have been trying to tell him. At that moment, he understood, and sitting in that van in a McDonald's parking lot, he gave himself to Christ. Seven years I've worked with that kid. Seven years. For that one moment. He's a father now. He's married. His life is going in the right direction. He's had some slip-ups. We all do. But he's not given up. And he still talks to me. I've got all kinds of kids 
who talk, I call them kids, they're 27, 28 years old. To me, they're still kids. I remember the little guy that I was seeing every Sunday at church. But even now, as adults, they'll still talk to me and ask me things and talk to me about some of their problems. And that is a treasure that I can't even begin to tell you how it makes me feel. Let the kids know that you can relate to them. Talk to them on their level. As I said earlier, who cares if they blow you off when you say hi to them? They're kids. They're kids. They're probably walking past you with their head like this, and they're just hearing you out of the, you know, in, the, in their side view, whatever. But I guarantee you, the one time you don't say hi to them, if you do it on a regular basis, they're going to notice. Talk to them. Listen to them. Don't preach to them. Sometimes you got to listen to find out what's truly going on. Some of the good things and the bad things that I've experienced in, um, in youth ministry. Um, as far as church council, I am not a programs guy. Not. I can teach it if you want me to teach the book of Matthew. But I've got a helper that's better at that than me. A lot of times I would go into Sunday school, or not Sunday school, I did teach Sunday school, but I would go into youth group and I would have something prepared that went here. And I would talk to the kids. We had a meet and greet for about 15 minutes before we started. And uh, I would talk to the kids and maybe one of the kids said something about they were having a problem or something. Guess what? That was out the books. It was gone. We were talking about this topic today. Get the kids in the Bible. If they didn't have one, we gave them one. Look in the concordance. Relationships? Okay, let's look up relationships. See what the Bible has to say. You look up relationships in the concordance. You might have 10 to 20 examples. You go and you start reading them. Maybe the first seven don't relate to you at all. It has nothing to do with your, your particular issue. That eighth one might. That's how I taught. You have a problem, let's talk about it. And let's not just talk about it, you and me. I can give you my life experience, tell you what I experienced, but I can't tell you how to handle your experience. It's not my job. My job is to give you some knowledge. Let's look in the Bible and see what that says. That's what we'll do. Again, one of the bad experiences for me. Money. The church. Council. I am not a conformist. I do not fit into a nice little box to do what you want me to do. I am not here to make you happy. I'm not here to make you happy. I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to take care of that kid. And I'm going to do that any way I can, whether it makes you mad or not. Because you are not my concern. You're an adult. If you cared enough about that kid, you'd be out there talking to him. You can't say you care about the kids, but you don't do anything with them. You can't say you care about the youth and you're not hanging out with them. It doesn't work that way. You go to their games, whether you want to or not. You go to the recital at school. You go listen to them play in the band. You go watch them play soccer. You go do whatever. As long as that kid sees you there, they know you care. That's all that matters. At the end of the day, that's all that matters, is the kid knows you're there for them. And you're doing your best to give that kid the information he needs. you got to have more than one person. One person can't do it themselves. And I'm a classic example because that core group of kids, I can hang out with them and I can talk to them and whatnot. But like I said, I had some of my last youth group that were more advanced than me. 
knew more about the Bible, was at a different spiritual level than I was, than I am. I'm okay with that because I had somebody over here that could deal with those kids, talk to them at their level while I took care of, you know, the bad kid Brent over here that needed more attention. All right? You got to have those things. It's not a one-man job. It's the whole congregation. It's the whole congregation. Yes, you see this as a house of worship. I try to teach the kids that this is a safe place. God created humor. God created everything. So why can't we laugh in the sanctuary? Why can't Pastor Brent and I tell stupid, corny jokes? Why can't Pastor Ravel bring out his banjo and his little puppet and, you know, relate with the kids? If that's what works for him to get through to that kid, that's a no-brainer every day. That's a no-brainer. All right? You got to, you, you have to be willing to do that. Because I'm not here all the time. Pastor Brent, not here all the time. I'm not saying you have to be 24-7 with the kids. But if you see a kid that is by himself, or if you see a group of kids that's talking, take five, ten minutes and just go talk to them. Hey, what's going on, man? Oh, shooting some hoops? Yeah, I used to shoot. Oh, man, that's horrible. I didn't even hit the rim. Who cares? You're hanging out with the kids. You're at their level. You're being one of the crew. You're not preaching to them. You're just hanging out. That means more than you guys will ever know. Support the kids. Support the congregation. Okay? Funds, money are always an issue for kids. You want to take, and, and this, is, this is what I would do personally. I would try to do four events a year. Um, rock was my number one. That was my go-to. Um, I've also done Acquire the Fire. I've been to Creation. Sometimes you don't get a lot of people when you do Creation because it is so expensive. But Rock, you can take a kid to Ocean City for a three-day Christian teen convention for about $105. I've taken groups as small as 12, the largest group I ever took was 93. Yes, some of those were adults because they got to have supervision. But think about that. 93 kids went to a convention center in Ocean City to hear about the Word of God, to listen to speakers talk about God, to listen to bands who played Christian music. It doesn't have to be an organ every Sunday. Yes, it's good to have those. It's very good to have those. I love hymns. But kids, you got to get them in here first before they'll start to love those hymns. If they listen to heavy metal, go online, Google Christian heavy metal bands. You're going to find a bunch of them. When your youth group comes the next time, have that music playing. Not just exclusively that music. Have some contemporary Christian, Toby Mac. You know, Mandisa. Stuff the kids are listening to, that style of music. Have that. But use a Christian band. They're out there. There's punk bands. There's metal bands. You got You just got to take the time. Because when that kid comes in, he's like, Oh, man, this is banging. Check this out. Whoo, whoo. I did not know he listened to this music. You got to reach the kids at their level. If you don't start at their level, you're getting nowhere. If you're demanding that they come to your level immediately, you've already lost. Yeah, they may go through the motions, but I guarantee you they ain't sticking with it. 
some other things that kids like to do. I don't particularly like them, but okay. Uh, Western Maryland Paintball. Sky Zone. Take them down to Hagerstown to Sky Zone. Take them to, you know, Morgantown to an escape room. You don't have to do it all the time. And yes, you're going to get kids that are not part of your core group. But that's the point. That is the point to get the kid that doesn't come all the time. If they don't have the money, find the money. We took in, um, we had a scholarship fund for anybody who couldn't afford to go. And we build it that way because you say scholarship fund, then the parents are more at ease rather than thinking, oh, I'm just bumming off of, you know, the church to go to this event. Well, that's not, you know, that's not the way I look at it. We didn't have a scholarship, but I told them we did because it made them more relaxed and more willing to accept money for this kid to go. And bottom line, I wanted that kid to go. He's the one that needed it more than the, the core group. There was a kid that just graduated two years ago, the year that I left. When we would go somewhere, I would take and give my kids money out of my pocket. I did the same thing for him. If I gave each of my kids a $20 bill, he got a $20 bill. If I'm at a ball game and a kid's obviously hungry, standing around a concession stand. I'm buying him something or I'm giving him money to buy something. So what if I don't eat lunch Tuesday? That kid's happy today. Ask yourself a couple of questions. Are you welcoming people into your church? Are you welcoming kids into your church? From what I see, I'd say no. Are you pushing them away? Are you? Are you accepting of them the way they look, the way they act? It might not be what you agree with, but you got to start somewhere. And if you never start, you've already failed. So why aren't you trying? You are the church. You cannot be judgmental of the way someone dresses to go to church. I do this intentionally. The kids that were here today, sweatpants, T-shirts, not a suit and tie, not a dress, T-shirt and sweatpants. They're here. Who cares what they look like? They're here. You know, you don't always get what you want. But you're going to get what you need. That's the way God works. He doesn't give you what you want. He gives you what you need. You want this church to continue in 10 years? Out there it is. Go get it. That's where the church is, out there. The ones that you're inviting in, the families 35 and under. And I don't see one in here. You want this church to live? Go find the families with the kids. Start doing things for the kids because that's what's going to get the families in here. If you have things for the kids to do, if you have someone for the kids to talk to and some place to hang out, parents will bring. And then you'll have your core group. If you don't, this church won't be here in 10 years. And that's just my opinion. But Center Street's sitting empty downtown. Where do you see this church in 10 years? Get the kids. The kids are the future. The kids today are our future. And if we're ignoring them, if we're not teaching them, 
our values, if we're not trying to guide them and help them along their journey, where are they going to end up? I don't know. Do you know? Guys, go get your kids. Thanks for listening. because I don't know where he's been. Um, how's prison life treating you? Well, you know, um, I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. Um, Monzel does work at the prison. And uh, it's one of those jobs that you just can't believe that these days somebody's actually going to be doing it. But I did not have any, I had a general idea of what Monzel was going to talk about because I know Monzel. I've known you since... 12 years, maybe longer. Seems like forever. And um, have I told you all who the tree girl is? Just give me five minutes, I'll wrap this up. The tree girl is, there's this friend of mine named Joy, who I just threw under the bus really big time by mentioning her name. But I met her when I was 10 years old. And we had gotten back, we were living in Bowie, Maryland at the time. And I know you've gone, this is going to be long-winded. No, it's going to be look, five minutes, I, I hope. But... Um, so I was riding my bicycle, and I was riding around the, the community in, in Yorktown. You know, Yorktown was the community I was in, and it's in Bowie. And it's a big horseshoe, big U. And she lived with her family down at the center in the bottom part, and I lived up at the top part on one side. And I was riding my bike, and I, I remember the first time I saw this girl, and she was the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. She's eight years old, and I was 10. And I was riding my bike by, and she's up in a tree, and she's got this beautiful blonde hair, and she's got this beautiful smile. And I go, I bet you, remember, I'm 10. I bet you if I ride my bike by really fast, she'll be mine. So I go around the corner one more time, and I am pedaling my heart out, pedaling my heart out, and she smiles and waves at me. And I go, yeah, I bet you if I come by even faster, she'll be mine forever. And so I come around the corner, and I'm pedaling my heart out. I'm pedaling my heart out. I'm going as fast as I can, pumping those, those pedals. And I turn the corner, and I get right in front of the tree, and my chain pops. And I wipe out, and she laughs, and we've been friends ever since, and she is who I call my tough love friend, and sometimes you need to have a little bit of tough love, and sometimes that tough love comes from God, sometimes it comes from kids, but um, Joy, when uh, I was going through my divorce, I call her up, and I go, Joy, I'm miserable. First of all, for those of you all don't know, I was married for 19 years. And then there was the divorce, and we had our reasons, but I called Joy, and I said, Joy, I just feel like crying. And she goes, well, then cry, stupid. I'm like, you, you, you do know there's a love besides tough love, right? And she goes, if you don't face the facts, if you don't deal with it, you're never going to get through it. And it's the same way when it comes to, because there are some people that on a Sunday, they're going, the pastor's not talking to me. He's talking about somebody else. So I want to do this. Everybody stand up for a second real quick. Just everybody stand up. Turn around and look at somebody besides somebody that's in your family. Say to that person, he's talking to you. And then tell them, love you. Okay, everybody sit down. Everybody sit down. So for the past, the past number of weeks, we've had 12 services where I've been talking about these two questions. And the two questions are, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Jesus isn't just going up to that man at Bethesda, at that pool called Bethesda, and asking this gentleman, do you want to be healed? We have been living with the dysfunction of our lives our entire life. And sometimes that dysfunction is because we are so wrapped up in ourselves that we can't see whether it's a child, whether it's an adult, whether it's, it's somebody that, that, that's older than us. We can't see the fight and the deal that they're struggling with. One of my biggest joys in life is, and I did it, this, I did it yesterday, matter of fact, is um, on Friday, I, I over at mom and dad's, and I said, Dad, I'm coming by, I'm going to pick you up at 7 o'clock in the morning. And he goes, okay. I said, have your fishing gear ready. We're going to go fishing. 
And he goes, great. So we went out. I only had two and a half hours to go fishing because I had a 10 o'clock appointment. And we went fishing up past Frostburg. But it was just having that time and spending it was the most glorious blessing I've had in a long time. And I, I see my parents multiple times a week. And, but it's still, it's that so much I can still learn from dad. Sometimes mom wishes I wasn't learning so much from dad. Sometimes she wishes I'd learn from her instead. But it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. You have the ability to have an impact on others. And we have that ability to make the decision. So that's what this whole sneaky Jesus is. It's about a decision we have to make. And we're going to make it every single day. And that decision is Jesus is walking up to you. And it doesn't matter if you're 50, 45, 52, if you're 182, if you're 93,000 years old, or even if you're as old as Peach is. Love you, Peach. You have that he's asking you a question. He's not asking you a rhetorical question. He knows what is in your hearts. And he is asking you, do you want to be healed? When the Israelites came out of Egypt... It was very easy to get up and leave Egypt. It was very hard for them to get Egypt out of themselves. It's very hard for us to change because we're so used to our ways. But sometimes for God to work through us and for God to work on us, there's one word that comes to mind and it's the hardest word you will ever master. Surrender. Do you want to be healed? Are you ready to surrender and welcome him as the Lord of your life? Later on, Jesus was talking about to the Pharisees and and everybody when he healed a man and they were asking him and he could tell they were already plotting his death because he had the audacity to heal somebody on the Sabbath. He had the audacity to say to these individuals, you've got religion, you've got no faith. You've got religion, but you've got no relationship. So he's asking them, what, why are you thinking that in your heart? Why are you thinking what you're thinking in your heart? Because that is what is keeping you from actually being healed. So on that walk to Emmaus, that return trip, you know, if we want to become more like Christ, if we want to actually welcome him in as the Lord of our lives and surrender to him, he's going he's gonna to take us on a process. He's going to take us on a journey. And he is going to challenge every single attachment we have, especially those attachments to us, to ourselves, to our traditions, to what we hold as our beliefs. So our beliefs, what they, what they amount to, like he was on the cross, he was seven last statements, and he's challenging our attachments to issues such as forgiveness, salvation, abandonment, thirst, which is desires. What do you desire? What are you thirsty for? When it comes to issues such as whether it was the end or it was just the beginning. So many times we cling to where we've been that we forget that Jesus is asking us to go somewhere new. Not one of us is a finished product. We are all still in the works to be finished. Not one of us is finished. And a lot of times we cling to the slavery of Egypt because it's a lot easier, it's a lot more comfortable to cling to what is known than it is to embrace the fear of the freedom that comes with surrendering to Christ. Times get tough. We're asked to think something new. We're asked to do something new. And we cling to that dysfunction that we've had, that way that we've been living. Or maybe we look to others for validation, and that's why we're not comfortable, because they're not validating us the way we want to be validated. We may even push away those who who challenge us to grow and rise above it all. We tell ourselves that this isn't dysfunctional. This is, I'm the right one. I'm the one, my life is the one that was the right one. 
And we have to ask ourselves, do we really want to be healed? Do we really want to surrender our lives to Christ? It's, it's not normal to live with anxiety. It's not normal to be overwhelmed by life and those we surround ourselves with. Normal isn't and definitely putting our life on hold for somebody or waiting for somebody to do everything that we normally want to do or refusing to take responsibility for the situation we find ourselves in. Normal isn't constantly living with drama, problems, stress, or that, that horrible radio station, WIIFM, what's in it for me? And just like the man at the pool named Bethesda, justifying our continued dysfunction is not normal. We have the opportunity to grow in our relationship with Christ. We have our opportunity to embrace him as the ruler, the Lord of our lives. But we have to surrender. Normal isn't regularly waking up uninspired, numb, or apathetic, or wondering, why can't it be about what I want? Why can't it be about, this is not the way we've done it. Somebody put the fork back in the wrong drawer. Has anybody ever gone to, who here has ever been to Center Street United Methodist Church in their lifetime? That's where I was married, Pastor Lloyd McKenna. There was actually an argument about somebody put the fork in the wrong drawer. And that argument caused people to walk away from the church and walk away from God. We have the ability to make a choice. This sermon series just came to me, and it's about decisions. And the first decision to make is, are you ready to surrender? So let's please bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, for Manzel. We thank you so much for everybody here opening up their ears, opening up their hearts, opening up their lives. I'm not going to ask anybody to publicly have an altar call this Sunday. I'm not going to ask anybody to publicly announce that they are willing and ready to surrender their lives to Christ. Because it's what in our hearts. What are we thinking in our hearts? And he knows what is in our hearts. Please allow us, give us the strength and the courage to open our hearts. To let Christ be the Lord of our lives. To let him be the coach of our life. And if you are one of those individuals who is ready to surrender your life to Christ, let's take a moment in silence and let's say, Father, I am ready to turn my life over to you. Say it quietly to yourself. Say it without even uttering a word because sometimes the biggest sermon you will ever do does not even use an uttered word. Amen. Two things to mention before we go today. Number one, um, the 25th, the last Sunday of this month, we will be able to have um, the return, um, returning the gratitude that, that we have for Holy Cross coming here. Um, we will be hosting the joint service on the 25th. I think that's the last Sunday of this month. But the last Sunday of this month, we will be at Holy Cross, the joint service at 11 a.m. There will not be a 9.30 service that day. And I hope to see everybody out there as we worship together again. And um, the other one is, if you are part of the SPRC, SPP, SPRC, if you are part of the S alphabet group here at um, Calvary, 
we have our meeting at some, what is it, 7 p.m., Alan? 7 p.m. on Tuesday. So if you are part of the SPRC, it is 7 p.m. Tuesday. Um, so please come out. Um, if you are with Holy Cross, thank you so much for coming out here and worshiping with us. It is such a joy to see the kids and such a joy to see all of the faces. And um, it is such a blessing to have two churches that are so passionate about Christ to be able to, to coach. And I mention the word coach because I've seen bad coaches. I've seen when we coach ourselves. I've seen when we are the, the standard bearer for our own lives. And there's a coach of a little league team, a 10, a, a 10 U team, a group of 10 year olds that are, are playing. I'm not even going to say that the sport is softball, but um, if you happen to guess that the sport is softball, then yes, it could possibly be softball. Um, but I, you know, I heard the coach cussing in front of the kids. I've heard him berating the kids, and I've seen the parents tolerate it. And we all shake our heads and go, I can't believe that. It's true. When we become the standard bearers for our own lives, I don't know about you. I want somebody that has a little bit better standard for my life than me. I want to surrender my life to Christ every single day and allow him to be my standard bearer, to make my decisions, to live my life, to love others, to forgive others, to give others the same grace that he's extended to me. Let's go forth today and let's extend that same grace to others. Let's surrender our lives to Jesus as the Lord of our life, the Lord of our hearts, and our standard bearer every single day. Somebody once said, why, is, why do you have to give a motivational speech every single week? And I said, well, it's, it's like soap. It doesn't last forever. You've got to reapply it. Going to God and surrendering to God is not a one and done thing. I don't know about you, but I need to surrender to God every time I'm at Walmart. I need to surrender to God every time somebody cuts me off in traffic. I need to surrender to God every time somebody gives me a flippant attitude. You know, there are numerous times when I'm sitting there and, and I get so aggravated I want to shake people. I, then I remember, God... Grace, forgiveness. He loved me before I was lovable. So we need to love others, even when we don't find them very lovable. So go forth, love on each other. Nobody's getting out of this thing alive. Amen. <laughs>